In this video, I'm going to summarize my arguments about publication and information. I think there are three key points. First of all, there's the question about what communication is, and particularly a critique of some of the assumptions about the nature of information. Secondly, there's a question about what modern science involves, and particularly the epistemological switch from a science based around certainty towards a science that's based on uncertainty. And finally, I think there's a question about what modern technology affords in terms of new possibilities of communication. And these three points are interrelated. The common denominator between them is, I think, something to do with counting. Counting is so important in our understanding of information, obviously in the Shannon equations, but more generally, counting involves the identification of likeness between things the similarity between different categories of things that we count. When we do science, we count like phenomena. Our information theory is a probabilistic theory based on the identification of like phenomena. Our practices of scientific communication draw references and comparisons between different articulations of understanding. Hume discusses how the likeness of eggs is established through sampling many eggs. So we have one, two, three, four, and the idea of surprises, like the dinosaur here, are essential to our understanding of information. Keynes argues that Hume's experiments should not have been too uniform. They ought to have discerned from one another as much as possible in all respects, save from that of the likeness of the eggs. He should have tried eggs in the town and in the country in January and in June. He might then have discovered that eggs could be good or bad, however like they looked. Keynes goes on to say that this principle of varying those of the characteristics of the instances which we regard in the conditions of our generalization as non-essential may be termed negative analogy. And this forms the basis of Keynes's own theory of probability because he says it will be argued later on that an increase in the number of experiments is only valuable insofar as by increasing or possibly increasing the variety found amongst the non-essential characteristics of the instances, it strengthens the negative analogy. I'm going to use this idea of negative analogy to talk about a different way of looking at similarity, which in turn presents a different way of thinking about communication. To get what Keynes is talking about, I'm going to give you an, an example. Here's an object, which is a melody, and here is two perceptions of that melody. And each perception is constrained by a number of factors. Let's call them A, B, C, and D. And there are differences between the constraints that apply to the first perception as compared to the constraints which apply to the second perception. But despite these differences, there is some kind of overlap between the two sets of perceptions, the two sets of constraints. The identity of the object, in this case as a melody, is established in the overlap of mutual constraint. There are elements in a melody or a tune that we consider to be the same and that we would count as the same, if we were doing some sort of Shannon analysis. The point about this is that the identification of similarity between melodies is constrained by the descriptions of the many other simultaneous things that are going on around those things that we see to be the same. So if you take a simple melody like uh, this entry from a Bach fugue, if I was to play exactly the same thing again, There are subtle differences. And the point I'm going to make is that it's those very subtle differences which are the essence of how we actually identify and sense similarity between things. So let's say that these two examples of the melody are both classes of A. So we have A1 and A2. And between A1 and A2, there are a set of descriptions and there are going to be similarities and differences between those descriptions. The identification of similarity between A1 and A2 is constrained by the descriptions A, B, C, D and E and so on. 
What are those descriptions? Well, first of all, there's the rhythm. So we've got an, a, a regular quaver pulse that goes... ...like that. We've also got a set of, set of intervals. So we've got a rising fifth, and then falling thirds, another falling third, and we've also got a sixth here to get up to that falling third, and then a second. So we've got a fifth, thirds, a sixth, a third, and a second. What else have we got? Well, we've also got a, a harmonic uh, sense behind this melody. So we, we our first opening four notes spell out a chord of A flat major. So that, that's fundamentally the harmony behind it. So there's another description um, behind this tune further description is the phrasing of the tune. So we don't play all of these notes with the same weight. We give it a, a bit of a shape. Which gives particular emphasis to the highest note. So each of these dis different descriptions can be considered to be A, B, C, D, E, and so on. This is where it gets recursive because the identification of similarity of the pulse, which we might just label lowercase a, is something that is constrained by the multiple descriptions that are occurring at the same time as the pulse. So here I can write them as subscripts of small a and call it a subscript a, b, c, d, and so on. And down it goes. For every single description, we see it as the result of the identification of similarity, where the similarity is constrained by the other descriptions. When you actually look into the detail of the similarity, even between things like the rhythm, there are subtleties in the differences between different instances of things that happen at a particular pulse where we can see that each instance of that sort of rhythmic pulse isn't necessarily the same as the previous one. The same goes for intervals, the same goes for harmonies and so on. And I think understanding similarity in this sense of appreciating the subtle differences between things help us to understand why it is that we see this as being fundamentally similar to this. And I think it also helps to explain, um, this is the subject of the fugue, is seen to be very closely related to the counter-subject of the fugue, which uses different notes, but is fundamentally similar. In terms of identifying similarity and counting similarity, the tune itself doesn't exist on its own. It exists in a context. And as the music progresses, the number of descriptions of the context within which the tune exists multiply. So there we have the counter-subject, which we can describe as being similar to the subject, but we also have a new description entering, which is the semiquaver linear motion, which goes... And in fact, even that is quite deceptive in the sense that it can be seen as a sort of scale... but it also can be seen as a series of gaps which are filled. So 
So there are many possible descriptions of what is going on in this music. So what I'm saying is that basically we perceive similarity between different elements in the music, like between melodies and harmonies and so on, and each identification of similarity is constrained by the other possible descriptions of the music. The other possible descriptions are themselves identifications of similarity which are themselves constrained by other possible descriptions and so on, and it goes down. And so the actual operation of this constraint in the identification of similarity works on the basis that there is never a perfect similarity between two events. And in fact, the layers of recursion behind the identification of different possible descriptions right down to the, the smallest level, the multiple levels of recursion present an inherently unstable fabric for the identification of similarity. And I would suggest that it's this inherently unstable fabric which is actually the root of the identification and emergence of new descriptions. And it's with the emergence of new descriptions that our perception of what is considered to be the same and what is considered to be different changes. And this helps me to understand how this music evolves over time but it also gives me an insight into our processes of scientific discovery where our new knowledge so often arises from our realising that something which we once thought to be the same we now see to be different. And so fundamentally this process of communication within music I think does offer us a glimpse as to how scientific communication operates within the context of many, many possible descriptions and how, if we merely constrain our scientific communication to a domain where the production of descriptions is limited by the capacity of the medium, that we miss the chance for genuine discovery of uh, new descriptions and new possibilities between us.